Well, hello everyone and welcome once again to another edition of Community College Presidents talking about community colleges. And uh, as I said in other introductions, often presidents uh, get together and discuss things going on in the community college world. We uh, share ideas, steal ideas, all kinds of things, best practices, whatnot. Typically this is done more on a regional or local level, but uh, with everything that's going on, we've uh, been talking to each other really more almost as a support group. And so uh, I've started these conversations, just that's really all they are, it's just conversations about how things are going. And so it's kind of taken off uh, bringing more people in, but I want to welcome my next guest, um, which is Dr. John Renoni from Dabney S. Lancaster Community College in Clifton Forge, Virginia. Uh, Dr. Renoni, how are you today? It's great. I'm doing well. It's great to be with you. Well, thanks for being here. And I got to tell you, Dabney S. Lancaster Community College is one of the fanciest community college names I think I've ever heard. That's that sounds pretty classy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it, uh, yeah, yeah. We certainly. Uh, I did not know anything. Uh, I've been here for seven years, and I did not know anything about the college or the college's name be, uh, until I applied and. It's named after a long local educator who was a statewide superintendent, and he was from one of our service areas. And um, I think today, I'm not sure you would name colleges after people, but that is certainly, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, in Virginia, it certainly is a uh, there's a number of schools named after some local and some famous people. Okay, well, in a place like Virginia, you know, there's a lot of history there, of course, uh, you know, being one of our, I guess, a lot of schools there are older, I suppose, maybe that's a kind of an older thing, but not a bad thing at all, of course, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure Mr. Lancaster is very deserving of that. Um, well, right. so speaking of that, uh, for those that don't know, and, and you and I don't know each other uh, really either, if you could uh, take a moment, talk about your past, introduce yourself a little bit, and then tell us about Dabney S. Lancaster. Sure. Well, th again, thanks so much for having me. Um, I, I've been in community college uh, for 30 years. Um, I started when I was 12, of course. No, no. Uh, but um, my first, really my first entree into community college, uh, where I find a lot of us start, is as an adjunct faculty member. I was working in um, training and education. Um, I went to school and got a communications degree, but I also liked the college setting. I liked workforce development training. And uh, I started teaching a communications class at night. And I was the youngest person in the room because, you know, you typically have adults. And I had 16 students. And it was one of the most um, rewarding experiences. And I still remember that to the day. And uh, I continue to teach. And I've uh, been an adjunct for almost all those 30 years as well and um, there was an opportunity to go work at a community college doing workforce development training uh, and that was in New Hampshire and then after six years I had I had an opportunity really uh, uh, that not many people have is to actually go build a brand new community college uh, and I was part of the original team that built uh, a, a, a community college in southern Maine, and we were the seventh and last community college built in the state. I went there as a um, as basically dean of workforce development, and just like a small college, the first day we had uh, students, uh, we had 150 students and only 17 employees, only four full time faculty. And, uh, and everyone stepped on everyone's toes because we were in a rental hotel. We were actually in a hotel and that was our, uh, my, my first office, I joke, was a vending room, which they converted into an office. Uh, but it was really an experience I would never, never change in my, you know, in my lifetime. And um, I was able to do a whole bunch of different things. Uh, even though I was in workforce, I reported to the academic VP. So that really exposed me to almost being the associate, um, of v, uh, the associate VP of academics. Um, I was certainly part of that team. 
And then over the year, four years later, I was interim uh, academic dean. Uh, as we had transitions, I had served as interim chief financial officer. And then about, uh, about four years in, four or five years in, I had a, then the second president said to me, someday you want to become a president, you need fundraising experience. And I went into our institutional advancement office. Uh, that was, um, uh, so I was, the, I was the VP of advancement, so forth, and the executive director of our foundation. And he said, oh, stay five years, and then that'll give you great. Well, 13 years later, <laughs> um, uh, uh, so I was there a total of 18 years, five years doing a bunch of things. And then uh, the CFO actually came while I was VP of advancement as well. Uh, we were a small college. And, uh, and then after about 18 years, I, I had uh, started to look for presidency. And, you know, my family's all from New England. Uh, and, but we were starting, uh, you know, my daughter was going to be a senior in college and she was in New Hampshire. And we really thought about the opportunity to look at, um, you know, Virginia, North Carolina. We didn't want to go across the country just because, you know, family's important to us and so forth. And, and I was fortunate that this was the only position I applied for. And, um, uh, and seven years, uh, you know, so seven years ago, uh, interviewed and was the successful candidate for this position. And, and I started in July of 13. And um, what's really, I think what might have been attractive for a search committee, a board, the chancellor, um, you know, in our system is because I had done a lot of things. Um, I came up a non-traditional track. I wasn't an academics, but I had done some of that. Um, but the college was really looking for a community outreach person, a fundraiser, um, you know, somebody who could communicate with faculty and staff and, and so forth. And I was really fortunate. This college is, in, is one of 23 community colleges in the Virginia Community College system. Uh, we are the second smallest and uh, one of the most ruralist uh, colleges. Uh, we serve a Community, our service area is about 70,000 people, uh, um, but about 1,800 square miles in, in area. Uh, we serve a, about 1,600 students uh, credit and through our workforce credentials program. Uh, and, and we deliver about anywhere between 80 and 90 actual credentials. Those are degrees, credit certificates, as well as workforce credentials as well. Um, and uh, we have, a, you know, it's a wonderful area in the, in the mountains. Uh, we certainly like the winters as compared to, as compared to New England, um, but we miss all, all our friends in New England and we get up there a couple of times a year. So yeah, well, that'll give you a little sense, yeah. It's beautiful. I mean, I know that that says your, your background that you have is your college. That's a, um, whatever day that picture was taken, it was a beautiful day. So I'm assuming it's like that all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, it's yeah, really yeah. <laughs> here, the, uh, the backgrounds of presidents and how they get there. And, uh, you know, I'm a relatively new president, but when I, when I talk to presidents, I hear, you know, they, some come from finance, some come from the academics, some come from student services, some come from not a higher education at all. It's just really interesting to hear those stories. And the different uh, non-traditional routes, if they're, I mean, if you want to call it that, to the presidency. One thing that makes you another non-traditional about you and, and myself, actually, is that we're both, we were both uh, first generation college students, I believe. And yes, uh, to be able to get uh, a presidency, I mean, to be in, I, I, there, were, there were times in my life I never thought I'd go to college or, or maybe even graduate high school. And so, you know, to be able to, to be at this is just such an honor uh, for me. And Talk to me a little bit about, you know, your background and the, uh, with the non-traditional upbringing and, and, and your history, how has that influenced how you've handled students and how you've uh, adapted and worked with students and, and challenges that, that they faced? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I was really fortunate. My parents were, you know, high school graduates, but they were not, uh, they didn't have an opportunity to go to college 
Um, uh, you know, I've always said, and I learned this from a previous president, you know, my parents' generation going to college was a luxury. Um, uh, my, uh, you know, um, this generation, well, my parents' generation was really more uh, sort of out of reach. My generation going to college was more of a luxury. And this generation right now is a necessity, as we all know. Um, but they've always, so um, um, I have sisters that are four years younger than me. And even though my parents didn't go to college, they always knew the importance of education. And they felt like that, uh, that they were going to do everything, um, you know, everything possible to send us, uh, you know, that we made sure that we graduated from high school. Um, you know, my father was a laborer, so I saw how hard he worked. And, you know, I, I was a good high school student, but, you know, I wasn't, I, I knew I wanted to go to college, but I didn't, I thought I was going to be an accountant because I took a bookkeeping class in high school and I really liked it. I understood it. I went to college actually, you know, to eventually become a CPA. Um, and I lasted about a year and a half and, and changed majors. I guess I'm more in the minority by only changing my major once when a lot of people change their majors multiple times. But, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the traits I have were really instilled in my parents. Um, you know, from my parents is, you know, work hard, being able to work hard. Um, we were what we, you would consider lower middle class, uh, you know, working family. I got, I, I would have been eligible for trio. I, I got, I got Pell. I was a Pell eligible student. Uh, I understand the students that we serve, uh, maybe more than somebody else. And I think that that's really important because I can really empathize with them, with our students on. Now, I was fortunate. I went to a four-year college. Uh, that's all I had to worry about was my studies, you know, that type of thing. I, I was on campus. We, between scholarships and Pell, um, and, uh, you know, I worked summers to help pay for tuition. Um, so, so I understand that. You know, my parents just couldn't write a check, okay, mm -hmm. that I had to work for that. If I had to work, and I was also a work study, so, but if I had to really work, I, I, I was a work study and I was fortunate where the money that I earned was my spending money. I didn't need it to pay my tuition, unlike our students do, okay? Uh, I, I didn't have a family you know, when I was going through undergrad and, and, you know, and so forth. And I think it's just the, the ability to work hard, to really understand, put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And really that experience of that first class that I taught, uh, teaching adults who were coming back to school at night to really, and most of them were all first generation as well to really understand that they were trying to better themselves by getting an associate's degree. It was a required course and they were, they were all working. They were welders. They were, you know, they might've been social workers of some kind. Um, and you know, my experience even post college has been, um, that, you know, I understand where where our students are coming from because I was one of them. I was one of them. Sure. Yeah, and that's really I think means a lot of means a lot when you can relate directly to your students. Of course, through past experience that um, that's that's really influenced how decisions I've made and and my team. You can really see that influence uh, on a daily basis. That's right. Uh, so I mean, the question I ask, yeah, I mean the question I ask about you know to my to my executive team and everything, how, how is this going to affect the student? Bottom line is, you know, uh, it's all about the students. And, um, and I think what that has done is kept me grounded from, you know, being in a, uh, 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 you know, just sort of being away from, and my interactions with students on campus, I've had pizza with the president, you know, a couple of times a semester. 
I'm still trying to figure out how I can do that virtually right now while we're in this. <laughs> but um, just to sort of listen to not only their own personal experiences, but, you know, um, I mean, I've always said I can't fix it if I don't know it's broken. So just the ability to listen to them. Um, and I also know that it may be that student's only meal that day. So this is a way to sort of indirectly be able to address some of their uh, non-academic needs as a way to be able to bring those students to campus. Right. And who doesn't like pizza, really? I mean, that's, you know, always a good That's exactly right. Uh, so that's right. lately, uh, I, I noticed you were recognized by Campus Sonar on uh, your social media use. And so I'm, I'm curious to know your as a president, I mean, I use a lot of social media. I, I try to follow presidents that do. That's actually how I came across you. Um, but how has that influenced or changed communication and, and your job as the president to be able to have that tool? Sure. Um, well, it's funny because the, you know, I've always been on Facebook and that's been more of a personal approach. And LinkedIn has really been more of that professional connection, that type of thing. Um, and I always swore I would never get on Twitter, but the first month I became a president here, I saw about other people who I respected as presidents, they had some presence on Twitter. So I started, I started on Twitter and, you know, I didn't really know what I was doing, but it was, but I, you know, you just end up learning and I, I like watching, I'm, I believe in the case method, copy and steal everything. So I was really trying to understand how other presidents, you know, and other people I respected on how they use Twitter and everything. And anyway, long story short, it really became a tool for me to not only professionally learn about, learn and meet individuals. There's a number of people I've met on Twitter and, and in many cases we were Twitter buddies and then I finally met them in person. Um, and it was almost like long lost. So professionally, I've been able to access rich data and rich information about what is happening in our world in community colleges from the use of that. It also has allowed me to connect with donors from a fundraising perspective um, and to make sure that they understand what, you know, all the great things that are happening on campus. It's allowed me to certainly connect with media. I have a couple of reporters who will see something that I might post or repost from the college. They will reach out to me and say, can, can we come to campus and do that particular story? Um, with legislators, I make sure that our legislators, even though we don't have an abundant amount in our, in our small rural area, they know what's going on on our campus. Um, certainly alumni, as a great way to see, you know, what continue. And then obviously the most obvious one are students. Now there's not a ton of students because of the age group on Twitter. I, I have just entered Instagram a little bit. I still don't understand completely Instagram, but I, I'm, I have a presence there and I will do some of the things both on Twitter, but Twitter is really my my, my work related and I focus on the college, I focus on community colleges, I focus on leadership. Um, and those are really the types of things that I'm really focusing. And what Campus Sonar actually recognized was more of the, really basically the themes and they have some, they had some proprietary research, proprietary analysis that they actually put these 250 um, two-year and four-year in, uh, people into this, and it spit out that I was in the top 10, you know, type of thing. And, and uh, I think it was content and, you know, and obviously on social media, we have certainly stayed away from any political, any uh, issues, any questions. Um, there are things that I will comment about if anything, nationally, especially how it may hurt community colleges or certainly may support community colleges. Um, but I've really seen it as a way to connect with a wider group of individuals, not only in my community, but also nationwide.
Yeah, and I, I really feel like it makes presidents more human, more approachable, uh, really kind of takes down That's that, right. that wall. That's that. right. Um, and you know, I've done, I've done a presentation on this to president to presidents about, you know, social media and a couple of, and there's really two points is that, um, I do my own, I don't have my staff do it. So that's, so number one is you got to have fun with it. The day it stops being fun is the day I'll stop doing it. Um, but the second thing is, is that you also have to be genuine. Mm -hmm. And I think that, 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 that human factor, as you talked about, comes out when you're genuine, you know, and you can poke some fun at yourself. And, you know, if I'm wearing something from campus or, or something like that, you know, get that picture and poke fun at yourself. I, I do think that that makes you, uh, you know, certainly a genuine individual that they know that and and hopefully a student will see that and say well you know he's not that scary wearing a tie and a suit or something in you know in our normal time um and i do think that it is uh um you know it's a way that students have reached out to me as well and maybe asked a question yeah i i i saw a uh, presentation one time a guy said if you know, run your own social media account because when you don't, it's it's obvious. It can tell that you're not the one doing it. You know, somebody pretending to be you. That's correct. Um, so uh, something I've asked everybody that I've talked to so far uh, is about pet peeves in higher education. I have a few myself, and maybe sometimes I feel like I'm just a, a grumpy guy about it. But uh, are there are there things that stick out to you that really kind of get under your skin about higher education or? Uh, yeah. Um... I guess pet peeves, and I don't have many of them. I've always tried to be very optimistic and, and you know, generally a positive person and, and everything. Um, in general, a pet peeve is when, um, uh, when somebody constantly comes late for meetings. Okay, so that's in general, sort of like, and, you know, everybody needs to be late for something. Presidents need to be late because a donor might have kept them a little later or something like that. But if it's constant, you know, uh, it starts talking about that person's separate time. And I think that that's a lack of respect. From a higher ed perspective, I struggle with uh, when they mention that they, that they, that they use the word, ter the, the term schools for community colleges and even universities. Or they may say a university and then the community, uh, then the community, uh, uh, then the schools. And again, it's no respect to our K through 12 partners, but they are a school. We're a college. And I think that that's some of that stigma. Um, and I've been uh, part with Steve Robinson on the, uh, on the end community college stigma, um, especially on Twitter. And part of that is the respect that, that uh, community colleges that we are we are a college okay we we are not we are not just the thirteenth year of high school um, and you know so if I have any pet peeve it's it's when the uh, somebody will mention that Dabney S Lancaster the school and again and I understand it's completely innocent but it's no the college because if they referred to um, Harvard, it would be the university. It would not be the school. Right. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Uh, so <laughs> part of the reason for doing these uh, sessions is to really also hear what, how you're responding to the COVID-19 crisis that this nation's been in. And so I want you to, uh, if you could briefly talk about kind of how uh, Dabney S. Lancaster has responded to this crisis and some steps you've taken. Sure. Um, so one of the interesting things is that um, in our academic calendar, our, our spring break was early this year, it was the first week of March. So the interesting thing is that when a lot of other colleges had their spring break the second week, they ended up extending their, their spring break a week and then sort of ramped up. Well, our students actually came back for a week. They came back after, and then what we did was we immediately canceled classes for two days and then ramped up on a when, what was a Wednesday, which is about five weeks from uh, tomorrow that, you know, five weeks ago. 
I have to say, and I've said this, is that I, and, and it certainly is not surprising because we have dedicated faculty and staff. The, the faculty and staff came together and ramped this up as best as we could, uh, that uh, really it was better. I, I mean, I could not be more proud just on how everybody stepped up. Sure, we've had some glitches with technology, just like anything else, and even communicating with students, but we have staff who are calling every student, every registered student, they've been calling every two weeks just to check in. Obviously, some we don't, we can't connect because of uh, their voicemail, be, voice box may be full, uh, you know, those types of things. But we have really stepped up. Uh, next week begins some uh, final exams in some areas, and then the week after, um, that's when the end of the exams. Um, the goal was to try to finish as many classes as possible. Um, as a system, we also had the support of the 22 other other community colleges, so we were able to really be able to communicate. Uh, that way and be able to learn from best practices. Um, you know, the students also were really, have been amazing. And I did a open forum with, uh, with some of the students and there were questions obviously about nursing and about pin, nursing pinning and, and those types of things. But, um, you know, the, the feedback has been extremely positive. Um, we have, uh, yeah, you know, we've been working from home, completely from home for almost four weeks now, uh, um, even the staff. Some staff are going in on, on designated days and they're spreading them out because they may need to use the large printer to print something out to get some communication. Um, um, we've been able to use some emergency funds from our foundation to respond to some needs of our students. We did have a food bank that we were able to wrap up all of the uh, the food and be able to prepare bags for students to come on the campus, even though the building was open, uh, was closed. Our, our building facilities, uh, who were still working and they're doing an amazing job with our housekeeping staff and, um, and safety and security have been on campuses. Um, I've been on campus three or four times. Um, a uh, couple times just to really check mail. And I've walked on campus, been able to be there. Um, we've also, uh, our, uh, you know, the last thing is that our uh, nursing programs and our, our um, emergency medical services program, we got all the PPE equipment together and we, and the first week we donated them to our three hospitals. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't a great deal you know, large amounts, but they really appreciated everything uh, that we had. Uh, we still have some gloves left and those types of things. And they know that if they needed anything, they could call call us. Um, we've, we've also connected students with all of the community resources and continue to do that. So we're communicating not only through text and, uh, and email, but also we've, uh, we have we have two website, uh, we have one website and two links. One's college communication, and then the other one is community resources with our food banks and with, uh, you know, SNAP benefits and our employee, um, you know, our unemployment offices and so forth, just to be able to continue to communicate. Um, I feel like um, for basically having about 40 hours to really ramp up, we have done a pretty good job. And I know a lot of colleges have done that. And I'm, I'm really proud the way we have really responded. Could we do more? Of course, you know, there's, there's certainly a lot more. And, and right now we're communicating not only with the students to help them get through the rest of the semester, but also starting uh, trying to help them to uh, have an advising appointment and be able to register for summer and obviously for fall as well. So then they don't miss a beat. And um, and I think we have just finalized our CARES Act dollars. So we'll be sending 
um, those dollars to our students um, uh, and, you know, for their use and hopefully they'll use it for educational purposes. But I know a lot of them who have lost their jobs, so they may need it for, uh, you know, for survival as well. Well, I think it's amazing how, uh, you know, you said this, and I'll say it here, that our staff and faculty are able to respond so quickly, uh, you know, to be such a challenge. And, and we just, we weren't ready for it when it hit. And, and you're right, the quick turnaround on that is really impressive. Um, right, so with right. With the time remaining, uh, I would like to give you two minutes of time to uh, say whatever you want, and then I'll come back in in the end and, and finish up. Sure. No, I, I I just appreciate, you know, the time that we spent. I, too, love to, uh, you know, I attend conferences and, and you know, and read a lot from, and, uh, and, and again, the connection through social media has really allowed me to get to know and, and learn about the great things that are happening in our, in our community colleges. You know, I didn't attend a community college. But I've spent my, I've committed my, my career to a community college. Uh, and I feel like that this was because as a first generation, as we've talked about student, um, you know, and, and, you know, and the connection, I just feel like um, we are, um, we are the, the community's college, the people's college you know, that type of thing. And I, I, I've been, and because of the roles I've had, I've always been more of the outreach person in the community. And I feel like that our, co and our college is going to help solve this workforce problem when we all get back to a new normal, whatever that new normal might look like. And, um, you know, and I love being entrepreneurial. That's the other thing is that you know, we need to, um, uh, I have joked with, with people as well as the, my, uh, one of my advisors from my, from my, uh, um, in my doctoral program, I said, hey, you didn't teach us this in our, in our doctoral program, you know, and they don't teach you this in present in school as well, you know, and I've always said that we're, 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 we're flying, we're, we're building the plane while we're flying it. But I think that um, if we can utilize the great people we have around us and use those resources and those skills, um, I think that we as an institution not only will respond to the students' needs now, but certainly to the workforce needs. Because if there is, a, and, and I just think back about the 30 years in community colleges, this is going to be certainly at the top of 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 that situation and 10 years from now look back and say remember how we started 2020 and and you know and so forth and and what and what we did there's going to be certainly a lot of lessons learned through this and um uh and yeah and there will continue to be a lot of lessons learned i i also am also optimistic because i also think that there will be good that comes out of this. I think we have maybe learned how to, um, how all faculty have been able to deliver classes online. I think we have enriched our various communication tactics. Is this a way for us to um, be more diligent even in meetings? You know, a lot of times as presidents, we go from meeting to meeting to meeting. Well, can we do some of them from a, statewide perspective uh you know and i'm always traveling the state more for statewide meetings versus regional meetings so is this an is this really an opportunity to be able to learn from this i also think that we will learn about how to maybe deliver our courses differently uh, uh how to be able to um uh i i do think that we need to figure out how to offer our services 24 seven, the non-academic pieces. Uh, we have tutoring and, you know, but what about those wraparound services? So um, I, I, I did not wish this on anyone, of course, but, um, but I, I certainly hope that people will see this. They will, they will be able to respond now 
But in the long run, uh, this is certainly a case study in, in future leadership in graduate programs on how to be able to sort of address some of these issues. Yeah, very well said. We've definitely learned a lot more than I, I've learned a lot more than I thought I was going to learn in 2020, to be honest with you, <laughs> and the role of president. Uh, well, thank you so much for spending this time uh, with me. It was great to get to know you a little bit and learn more about Dabney S. Lancaster and your responses uh, there to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, just really appreciate your time and, and uh, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.